John Fung, welcome to Property Insights, mate. Thanks, Mark. It is an absolute honor to be here. Uh, yeah, you're the CRO, otherwise known as the Chief Revenue Officer at Domain. That's correct, yeah. Um, and Domain being one of the two um, duopolies, I guess, that exist in the marketplace when it comes to uh, listing of homes and, That's right. uh, and other things. Yeah. Uh, alongside realestate.com. One slightly larger than the other. Realestate.com is a little bit larger than you guys. Probably been around a bit longer too, I would say. A little and, bit. They yeah. they both came from print heritages, both started in the you know, 2000s. So. Yeah, yeah. I, remember, I remember when they sort of kicked off. I actually remember realestate.com when... Um, the Murdochs were uh, first involved in it, and I thought, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> Little did I know the, the, the giant that they turned it into. So just tell me, if you don't mind, yeah, of course. Uh, just give me a little bit of an insight as to who John Fung is and uh, like, how did you start off in the real estate industry or have you not always been in the real estate industry? Sure. So John Fung grew up in Sydney uh, on the North Shore. My parents migrated from uh, Malaysia and Hong Kong uh, before I was born. They migrated in the 70s. Uh, grew up here, loved it here. My first foreign property was at the age of 18. Uh, my dad uh, was actually a real estate agent. That's oh, really? where he finished his career, yeah. And I think part of being a big thing for them, they were Southeast Asian migrants, was as soon as you get an income, you invest in property. That's what you do. Uh, and so me and him, as soon as I turned 18 and got my, uh, I guess my first paycheck when I was working during uni, uh, just started investing in stuff. And then I probably purchased about 20 properties over the next 10, 15 years. I see you're a big property investor. Uh, well, I guess relative big in quantity. Least, yeah, yeah, I mean, relative, yeah, it's been a huge part uh, of, of my life, uh, of, of our family's life, of how, I guess, what we do with our money and, and how we think about security. What is that? What is that about? Um, I know lots of other cultures have the same view on property too. Particular, well, maybe it's more migrants. You know, they, they come out here and... Uh, Property represents a fairly stable and understandable asset class. Yeah, that's right. What do you think, or do you think it's endemic to say Chinese, Malaysians, Hong Kong, Chinese, whatever? I mean, like, do you think it's more your culture, or just all cultures that come out to Australia? I can see for many cultures, and let's not forget, Australia is probably the greatest culture for you know in property investment in the world, and that was well before migration was a thing. So I think part of it is just Australia is such a great, it's the Grand Prix you know, of property investing, I'd say, around the world on a per capita basis. I think when I think of the Southeast Asian heritage, where I guess even though I don't feel as entrenched in it anymore, I can't even speak Chinese or things like that, though I obviously eat a lot of the Southeast Asian food, uh, as extent of my expertise. But we all do. We all do. Um, there's probably two things that really lend itself to property. Number one, Asians do statistically save more. You look at cultures like Japan, which can be a problem actually if you oversave from an economic point of view, but that desire to save as much as you can and invest that savings is probably one you know, generalization of that group. The other thing is the comfort with leverage. Uh, it, it's in terms of in terms of borrowing, in terms of borrowing, in terms of in terms of borrowing, in terms of mortgage broking, um, you know, a lot of the the deals that are done in Southeast Asia by mums and dads would probably make a lot of us blush, right? And so it's just how much risk that is, you know. And there's a real downside to that, as we're seeing in various parts of Asia right now. But you put the complex of those things together, it means there is a culture passed down generations that as soon as you get money, you borrow money. As soon as you get an income, you borrow money and you put into property. Um, so that's, I guess that's where I came from. Well, where's the, where, where do you, I mean, Asians are well-known, particularly Chinese, are well-known for their ability to take risks. Yeah. But wh where's the difference, though, culturally between punting on asset classes like property? Um, in other words, buying something on 5%, uh, not have to settle for three or four years because it might be a pre-sale. Yeah. Um, and um, playing the game where it might go on value and you can sell it before you settle and make a quid. Where's the, the trade-off between, for you, for example, the trade-off between that and then buying property, settling it today, sitting on the income, making, allowing the rent to pay down the mortgage and building on, upon that as a, as an, as a portfolio? Where, where's, the, where's the balance between the two? Like, is it a cultural thing? Is that something that, you know, the punting part of it that you saw or you just use, you invest because it's a steady asset? I think my own cultural experience now is very, it's so specific. So I guess where I grow now, I'm not even sure what is true of most Southeast Asian migrants versus just true of my family. I would not describe us as being particularly risk loving, right? So it wasn't like we went in and said, let's leverage everything, let's really go big or go home. But I would say that there was a spirit of you maximize your leverage to a safe level and you invest everything you can. Ma that is maximize the amount of money you can borrow. Ma maximize the amount you can borrow. Now, again, within safeguards, like, for example, we us growing up, we'd never want to get mortgage insurance. So we never had less than a 20% down payment, yep. which is kind of going rate, you know, as, as many of you know. Uh, so that was definitely the case. Uh, 
again, I can't necessarily generalize for other people, but if you take that logic, and that's a logic which I've probably kept the last 30 years of my life, is, okay, have money, how much can I invest? How much can we borrow safely where we're not you know, starting to, to trigger this as a high risk ability? Working with mortgage brokers has been a critical part of that. We can look, how much can we push it? And then just going, making sure that, you know, if the market goes down 50%, can we tolerate that? If I lose my job, can I tolerate that? And that's, I guess, been always how my, my family has viewed investing, which is, I guess, pretty leveraged compared to most folks who'd buy one, pay it down, get to 100%, pay it down, buy again. We were constantly buying, rebalancing. But, but, but on the basis that your, your, the value of the property, the equity of the property has gone up. I think it's, yeah, two, it's two things. I or think your income has gone up. Usually when, when equity goes up or income goes up or rent goes up, we try and refinance, right? So even of those things are true. I think to your point, um, we would always try and make sure we could withstand a downturn. If we lost the job, if rents went down, if there was a lot of vacancy, uh, you know, if interest rates went up, you, you play at these various scenarios. And for, for me, if I think about my investing now, I'm well removed from my parents. This is me and my wife investing now. We are thinking about how to leverage up to that point where we could take a catastrophic event and we would still not have to sell things. Uh, that's basically how we think about investing. So but when you say we, you're, you're saying we. So is it important to invest alongside someone, uh, like probably in the early days by the sound of things, you invest alongside your dad perhaps? Yeah. Or at least with his guidance. Um, and now you're investing with your partner, your wife. Yeah. Um, how important is that? Is, I mean, is that a, um, obviously we, you know, we want to invest alongside our dad because it's just a <laughs> nice thing to do at the time or we want to allow, invest alongside our wife because it's a good f- function between the two of you. Um, and to prepare for your, you know, your both of your future retirement. That's right. I understand that. But how important is it in terms of the risk assessment? So, like, is it important, do you think? I mean, is it, or is it more comfort to ah, you? You know, the most important investment decision you make is, is who you marry or who you partner with. Uh, your ability to be on the same page or to disagree and commit to each other is crucial. It all, not just to find your financial success, but also your emotional happiness. Uh, I think me and my wife are very lucky that we are on similar pages when it comes to risk aversion as it pertains to, to finance investing. That's not true in other parts of life. So conflict resolution is, is really important to us. Uh, and so I think in answer to your question, uh, I think it's really important you're investing alongside people who you are on the same page with. And even if you don't agree on how much risk to take, that you agree on how to resolve that question. If you don't well, have that, it's going to uh, be very What does that mean then? So let's say yeah. someone younger is listening, they're sitting there th- thinking about their partner, they're not married, they, they don't know enough about each other at this stage to commit. Um, but they both have enough income yep. together for they borrow the money to go and buy a property. Yep. Yep. Um, and they both really want to get into the property market. Um, in terms of conflict, do you think they should enter into an agreement? <laughs> it's a great hypothetical. I would say the best way to think of that hypothetical is play out the downside case. Downside case could be you both want to get in but you can't agree on the property. Or you both agree on the property and then something goes wrong. Or you buy the property, it goes great, and then one of you wants to sell, one more doesn't. What is your level of confidence that those questions can be resolved in a way that is going to deepen your partnership as opposed to split it up? And I think if you can't be confident, I would, I would, not, I would not enter that stuff yet. Would you, would you, would you say to your, you know, your potential uh, business partner, who might be your partner, and it doesn't even have to be your partner yeah, in, yeah. Life, in a life sense. It could be your mate. Yeah, yeah. Could even be a brother or your sister for that matter. Um, but people change their mind. You know, things change. I mean, they might go and get married or they might totally. go to another country. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you think people should enter into one of these agreements, the what if agreement? So in the event that um, me, John, I can't decide what, uh, I can't agree with what you, Mark, want to do because right. we need to renovate the kitchen or whatever the case may be. All cool. Got it. Um, in that event, one partner buys the other one out or that's alternatively right. something along those lines. Do you think that's an important thing to do? Do you think people yeah. should do that? I, I think, and again, I'll, I'll maybe uh, discern between financial marriages and I guess relational marriages, I think a prenup is crucial if you're going to do that. And, yeah. and just for a sake of wisdom, I wouldn't do that. Even when I've invested alongside my family, it's been very clear ownership. So we haven't like gone 50-50 on a property or things like that. Uh, I think that would be, because life changes so much, it's so unpredictable, I think that's pretty risky. So I would ideally not do it. If you had to do it or really want to do it, you better play out those scenarios, have a really crisp prenup, because who knows what life will throw at you. Yeah, that's very interesting, because I think Domain actually put out some um, data a little while ago saying that there's a greater proportion of people today who aren't in a, a, a typical relationship, not that's right. married necessarily, but they could be mates, who are actually going into the property market because 
because there's a stretch in terms of servicing yeah, these days, of course. they use their, their double income to actually get into a market which they would otherwise not be able to get into in terms of yeah, the amount of money yeah. they need to borrow and the amount of money they need to save in order to get to you know, a reasonable deposit. And that is a thing now. It's, it's a thing. It's a thing. So yeah. those people probably should have at least, even if it's not a, a deed that's sort of enforceable, a document, a page that says this is what happens totally. if something goes wrong. Because things turn uh, yeah. shit. Like from, you know, things can get pear shaped pretty quick. Uh, yeah, ex exactly. I mean, I would do. I would definitely do a deed and then some. Again, I've never been. I guess I've been fortunate, or I guess I haven't chosen to be in the situation, apart from with my married partner. In which case, we're all in with each other anyway. Um, but you know, life is so long. So many crazy things happen. Even if you guys got on great. You might get married to people who have different views of opinion uh, to the other, right? And so, I, I would really prepare. I would definitely do that. I'd play at those scenarios and I'd find a way to legally codify it so good boundaries can make good neighbours. And I think the clearer it is, the better. Because actually, the last thing you want is that you're feeling not comfortable and you don't have something that, you don't have anything legislated for you that resolves it. Exactly. And then you, all you end up doing is getting stressed and anxious about the whole bloody thing uh, and, it, and it does turn pen shake. Can I just talk to turn to domain for a second? Yeah, I mean, sure. As a chief revenue officer, what, is that, what does that mean? So domain's got over a thousand people in the group yep. uh, spread throughout Australasia. I get to lead over half of them yep. uh, and they're the people who are facing our, I guess, our, our, our real estate agent group, right? So we're very fortunate that um, the people who recommend us, who use us, are the real estate agents who are helping vendors sell their house. Uh, we also have a few mortgage brokers there who use some of our price finder products, etc. My team is responsible for selling to them, account managing them, making sure they have support, making sure they uh, know uh, how their products are performing and resolving any problems. So that means Chief Revenue Office means like you're sort of head of sales That's relative right. to what domain sells. That's right. Yeah, I'm responsible for the revenue number and the sales that go with it. So maybe you should explain, could explain to our audience that we know domain as a property marketer, so to speak. I yeah, mean, that's we, right. We go to domain because we look at something that might be for sale, but actually domain's not selling. And what domain actually sells is they sell to real estate agents in order for real estate agents to list their, their clients' property on your, that's right. on, your, on your portal. That's right. How many people do you say? Half. half. Yeah, that's about, about 500 half. people. So around Australia, you've got, you know, quite a few hundred people floating around the place who that's right. tend to go and meet real estate agents that's right. and say, this is what domain has to offer. That's right, yes, yeah. that's and, right. And so what, what's the, the spiel? Like, uh, <laughs> what, what does domain have to offer? So domain's got two kinds of products. The major product, which is the vast majority of our revenue, are products that you refer to listings. And effectively, if you want to sell your house, you can, there's a free version where you can upload your property to be on the domain app so people can find it through. So you can do it for free? You can do it for free. Yeah, yeah. Let me, uh, the, let me the vendor, I can put up there for nothing. Uh, yeah, for example, yeah. right? Uh, now, again, the, the more that you choose to pay, the more features, the more compelling yeah. uh, that is. Uh, you know, for example, for agents, branding is really important. So the, the more you pay, the bigger your logo. And the more that you pay, if you, you're what we call a Platinum Edge user in this case, uh, you'll actually have you know product placement at the very top of the search results, which we know from Google is really important. Yep. Uh, so I used to work at Google for a long time and on the search engine, so we all know the importance of, uh, of ranked search. And so that's, that's our main product uh, that, that basically is, an, uh, is domain selling to an agent who then recommends to a vendor saying, hey, you want to sell your property? Uh, well, you need to buy some signage. You might want to take out an ad in the Silver City Morning Herald uh, and it'll be a few thousand dollars to appear on the domain app as well. In terms of your current inventory, that yeah. is properties listed for sale That's right. from agents, um, what is... The level of inventory today in domain. The old days you used to be able to get a magazine. You could see how thick it was. <laughs> today it's a uh, you know it's online, so it's hard to see how thick it is. So, what is the level of let's call it listings today relative to say I don't know mid COVID and maybe one again pre COVID. Sure, sure. And there's two concepts here. There's one is which is the the stock concept, which is how many listings are on the market right now. Uh, the way that I look at the market is more the flow concept, which is in a given year, how many listings enter the market, right. regardless of when they sell to, to, and that kind of like, you know, alleviates the days on market, you know, disparity. So historically, you know, on the portals, there's about 550,000 listings. On your portal? Uh, not on our Both. portal. Most of them are on our portal, yep. right? But 550,000, you know, in Australia right. that come to the market every year out of about 11 million properties, right? So about Do you mean 5%. for auction or for, for either? It so, could be auction, could be sale. Right. We can't track private treaty. So right. off market is, is by definition not seen yep. by us, yep. right? But you've got about, you know, 550,000. And that's a typical year if you look over the last five or 10 years. 
Now, post COVID, that financial year when we came to COVID, that was five hundred eighty-five thousand. So, twenty twenty-two. Uh, yeah, FY twenty twenty-two, where it was about six seven percent above historical average, which is a a very large number, yeah. right? And and what that looks like is, you know. 80% of sales always happen. Births, deaths, marriages, empty nesters. You can play with the time a little bit, but you've got to sell, right? And so what's happening in that you know, financial year 2022, post-COVID, is people are bringing forward every sale they can because the market is so hot, right? But last year, uh, last financial year, financial year uh, 23. You know, 23, it dropped from 585,000, which was the, the year before. Remember, the average is 550,000 to about 505,000. Right, so that's a, quite a big drop. It's a big drop, a drop of 16%, 17%, yep. uh, and 10% versus normal. And that's massive. That was a historically terrible year. Uh, one of the worst years of the last decade. Of 23. Uh, yep, yeah, financial year 23. In terms of listings for you guys. Yep, listings. I, how I, many? Is this market wide? Like, would it be the same maybe for the other portal? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm giving Australian numbers. Uh, Australian so, numbers. So, Domain has most of these properties yep. uh, are on our portal, but not all of them. Uh, but that's that's basically the entire, uh, the entire flow of how many listings are entering. This year, we're actually on track to do only slightly better. Than, so, than 2023. Yeah, so FY23 was uh, 505,000. We're currently on track to do 505, 510. The thing that's different about this year is the mix shift. So Sydney and Melbourne, Sydney in particular, is doing much better than the year before. About an average year for Sydney, and last year was a terrible year for Sydney, down 15, 20%. Last so, year be 23. So yeah. can I ask you this? Do you then, uh, do you then in your analytics, I mean, you're an ex-Google person. Yeah. Uh, so I analytics are important to you guys, like for your organization, yeah, incredibly yeah. important. Do you then uh, go back and do you, do you build some behavioral um, science around why there's been a shift in the, not so much the number of places, but the types of the areas or the values or Sydney versus you know Adelaide, et cetera? Are you going back and saying, well, because Sydney's on fire and Sydney's gone up by the most yep. in terms of the last six months or whatever it is, five months, People are sort of cashing in. Do you do those sort of analytics? Yeah, well, I guess we do analytics in two ways. We do a lot of backward-looking analytics, which is like, why is this happening, right? And typically where that comes down to, ultimately selling behavior is a result of buyer behavior. So if you go back, why did things drop so much in FY23? It's because with the rising interest rates inflation, all the buyer confidence went out of the market. No one wanted to buy. No one could borrow money. Uh, people were worried even if they had the money that they were going to lose their job. They were uncertain. And ultimately, seller behavior followed by behavior. So we, we do a lot of that backward-looking stuff, and I can talk about what's happened recently there. We do a lot of forward-looking, but it's less on trying to make predictions on a national point of view. We do do forecast house prices. For example, back in June, we forecast that house prices would go up about 6 to 9% nationally uh, in FY24, and that's on track to do so. The, the way that we do most of our predictive analytics is with AI, and we have a product called LeadScope, where a real estate agent can grab their whole CRM, their whole database, and basically plug it into our system, and we can then give it a percentage chance of selling between zero and 100% over the next 12 months. And that's using hundreds of different signals. Part of it is very broad demographic signals, what's happening in the market. Some of it's very specific to that particular suburb, what's happening, that level of buy interest, uh, some of the, the comparables of selling prices versus reserve. And a lot of it's actually at the house level because generally we, the person in that house is either a user of domain or the Channel 9 properties like the AFR, City Morning Herald. And based on what they're looking at and what they're doing, it's a pretty good indicator of whether they're in intent to sell over the next 12 months. Like, What are they searching for? Are they doing a lot of, a lot of uh, seeking behavior in domain? If they are, they're probably looking to sell and buy. So what can you, can you pull out something now that sort yeah. of is, is glaringly obvious to you guys in a, in a data sense? For example, if I'm a buyer, should I be investing in Brisbane because there's, uh, the Olympics are coming there or whatever? Like, uh, I mean, what what are the indicators showing you today on any aspect? Should I be selling somewhere? Should I be buying somewhere? Regional areas doing better. I mean, is Sydney a standout? Obviously, you know, in terms of the yeah, performance, yeah. Sydney seems to be a bit of a standout. And is it because there's more jobs there? Is it because of population growth? Sure, what, sure. What are we looking at? So... I'll give a slight cop-out answer here, but then I'll give something specific. The, the cop-out answer, which is I generally believe in and is my own investing philosophy, is don't try and time the market. Yeah, yeah. Maximize your time in the market, right? Uh, and that's really what, what I've stuck to because I've, even the last three years, we've constantly confounded what's happening. Even what's happening right now is unbelievable. How can you have rising interest rates and rising house prices? It hasn't happened in 30 or 40 years. Same with COVID. We thought COVID would be Armageddon. It turned out to be the greatest boom in 10 years, totally. right? So... I think in making short-term predictions, it's, it's challenging. 
I would say in the long term, the way that I think about, the, the way that we and Domain think about it is on the topic of scarcity, right? So you have two things. Demand is what is the, the population flow? How many people come to Australia? A lot, generally going to Sydney and Melbourne. Where are people going within Sydney, w within Australia? Generally to the Gold Coast uh, and Brisbane and to a lesser extent the regionals and that's kind of plateaued a little. So you take that part of the supply equation, uh, the demand equation, where's the demand for homes? Uh, and then look at the supply equation, which is where is there scarcity when it pertains to land? Where are we landlocked because mountains are blocking us from building? Where are we development locked because you just can't build more in the areas people want to live in? You put all these things together, it's very, very hard to beat Sydney. It's just so hard to beat Sydney because it's the place where, you know, most, not most, but about half the migrants are coming into. Uh, it's a place that's very hard to build, you know, unless you go very far out. Uh, it's a place where there's always demand and that demand is only increasing. Uh, you must have seen the recent report of how many millionaires are coming, are flowing from Asia. And Australia is the number one destination in, in 2023 for millionaires, not on a per capita basis, just in general. You have more millionaires from around the world wanting to come to Australia than America, than the Middle East. I mean, just extraordinary. We had, it was such a lucky country. And so you've got that happening and you know that a lot of them are coming to Sydney and Melbourne. You know that we can't increase the supply, particularly of kind of established homes anywhere near. I mean, how can you build a five bedroom house, you know, anywhere within near the Sydney CBD, you know, right now? And that's a recipe for rising prices. Yeah, and I th and it's funny, you know, it's, it may well be shown out in terms of data, but it's sort of like a, a logic. It's a logic that you can actually explain in a narrative. It makes a lot of sense what you say. There is no new supply. You can't go and build a whole new, 50 new terraces in Paddington. Yeah, that's right. It's not possible because there's nowhere to build. There's, it's, it's, it's done. <laughs> so if you want to live in Paddington because that's close to your work or close to your colleagues or close to your family yeah. and you've got the money, then you're going to pay the price. Yep. And then that's, that logic makes a lot of sense. It's just total logic. And the same applies to Brisbane, Gold Coast in particular yeah. as well. Like it's going a bit nuts at the moment. Um, some of the regionals. Um, I, I'm a little bit disappointed in Melbourne. Melbourne hasn't really responded as well as Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Anything, anything you can add to that? Melbourne's such an interesting place. Uh, you know, now it's, it's even got a bigger population than Sydney. Yep. They're one of the very few areas. You look at, for example, you know, one and two bedroom apartments near the Docklands. It's one of the very few asset classes which did not see meaningful growth over the last 10 years, uh, meaningful price growth in this sense. I think, Mel I think all of Australia can improve how we do our zoning and how we try and match the supply of housing with the various demands required. And Melbourne was one of those cases where that didn't quite happen. Yeah, it, it is an odd place, particularly in the Docklands, particularly there. And uh, and I don't know, like, you're right, it's a, it's a planning issue. Um, but I don't know why, I just don't know why it doesn't work in the Docklands because it's on the water, it's close to the CBD, um, the apartment buildings are quite nice, um, the, price, <laughs> the pricing is pretty good. Price yeah, is yeah. pretty good. So I just don't know why it doesn't work. But I want to ask you one more thing, just finally, if you don't mind. Yeah, John. sure. Um, Canberra. Yeah. Um, was hot about a year ago. Yeah, yeah. And it was going hard uh, in terms of increases. Seems to be a little bit flat at the moment. Um, but the, dem the the sort of the sort of the data doesn't really change. I mean, it's it's a it's a high high employment or low un lowest unemployment, yeah. low vacancy rates, yeah. still affordable. Like it's in that zone. You only have to borrow five six hundred thousand, um, mostly to buy apartments and more for houses. Um, Government city, everyone's got two jobs. I mean, <laughs> so, double families, both got a job working for the government. So, you know, your job security is pretty good. What, what's going on in Canberra? Any, any insights into Canberra? The thing I'd say about Canberra is we see a lot of steadiness, as you say, in Canberra. Uh, you know, generally people are there. When they're there, people don't leave there. They have family there. It's, it's a wonderful living situation. And so when you're in that situation, I think we see a lot less peaks and troughs uh, in terms of what that, what that looks like. And so it's a good market. It stayed a strong market. Canberra was one of the most resilient markets for us, you know, during the past 24 months. So it had a bit less upside than Sydney saw, but it saw a lot less downside over the past year. So I think that's what I would say. To, you know, a lot of these areas, and I'd put, you know, let's put Hobart in another interesting well, it example. It hasn't right? performed. It hasn't performed, but now is really going to perform, I think. A lot of this oh, is, You think so now? Uh, it, we're seeing some, you know, positive signs. I mean, it hasn't been the case. And part of that is just... You know that if you draw a straight line over time that's slowly going up and to the right, that's going to be right. Yeah, yeah. So typically, you know, it's a good place like Tasmania. It's got good jobs, tourism, you know, uh, you know, education there. There is going to be that demand. 
And over time, houses will get more expensive as the land that people want gets more and more scarce. So part of it is when things go down, they do tend to go up, just as the other way, other way around. Or when things go up, they tend to, to grow more slowly. So that's what I'm seeing in Canberra. I would say those those that that sign curve, that kind of up and down, is probably less pronounced. You've got such a steadiness and a, and a strong tenant base there. And finally, in terms of your own personally investing process, yeah, um, do you tend to um, countercyclically? invest in other words let's say canberra is a good steady joint it's got all the right stuff going for it in terms of the factors it's on a little bit of a flat position at the moment would john fung invest in there now as opposed to say investing in sydney whilst sydney's going to be going up and up and up and up so kind of uh, i i would in theory if i had if i had you know 10 million dollars to invest straight in cash now saying great want to enter the market something like a canberra would definitely be in that bucket i think the reality though is just given some of the philosophy we've spoken before I'm always pretty much all invested in the market already. Yep. Right. So you know what I have, and you know I I, I used to live in America for the last well 10, 15 years. Uh, so a lot of my investments are there. Uh, we we bought a family home here back where I grew up on the North Shore. So when I bought those properties, uh, we tend to you know spend as much as we can, work with mortgage brokers to maximize our leverage, which means that I don't have spare money, or I can, but it's costly. I have to take a transaction. So the reality is, even if I saw Canberra as an opportunity. I would not be selling another property, incurring that 10% transaction charge to do it. If there was a windfall, you know, an inheritance or a big raise or some equity grant, I would certainly consider it. The only counter side is I do think that investing, a lot of it is about, it, it's such a, a local business. I want to make sure I invest when I have, where I have expertise. Again, stocks are a little different. It's very passive. But, you know, when you're investing in a house, it makes such a big difference what corner it's on. What's it close to? What's the feel of it? I want to, I want to do those things. I want to make that call. Am I willing to invest the time to get to know Canberra well, to know which suburb, which corner to invest in? You know, I'm probably not at this stage of my life with young kids at all. So that's a pretty big factor, even if there's a lot of capital gains to be made. So, in other words, know, know the area. Got to know that it's a local business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not a dartboard. I think the stock market is a bit more able to, to play that game. Uh, this one, if, if you play that game, you, you, you get caught out. Expertise, whether it's great buyers, agents, or mortgage brokers. To me, that's the real secret of leverage, uh, using someone else's knowledge, paying them for it. Uh, that's how you make great investment decisions. 100% agree with that. John Fung, thanks very much, mate. Thanks, Appreciate Mark. it. Uh, pleasure with the show. Thanks for all you do.